and welcome to the Horace Mann School inaugural alumni webcast. My name is Vicki, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239. We do encourage everyone to use the audio broadcasting, but if you'd like to join the teleconference via the phone, you'll need to close the audio broadcasting box and request the phone by clicking on the phone icon below the participant list. It will then provide you with the dial-in number, along with the event number, and your personal attendee ID number. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question at any time throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the bottom right side of your screen. Please send questions to all panelists. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the link to the recording will be available to everyone through your email. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce you to your first speaker for today, Dr. Tom Kelly, head of school. Dr. Kelly, you now have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. In honor of our 125th anniversary, Horace Mann School is pleased to invite you back into the classroom through a series of webcasts by HM teachers on subjects of interest to alumni of all ages. This, our inaugural webcast, will feature Dr. Jeff White, an influential physics teacher at Horace Mann School for over 30 years. His presentation, Complexity, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, shares with you the kind of teaching and learning that happens at our school every day. Horace Mann School is dedicated to preparing a diverse community of learners to lead great and giving lives, and our alumni community exemplifies our success in supporting this mission. Among other goals, our school works to provide a caring environment in which mutual respect, mature behavior, and the life of the mind can thrive. I think you will see in this presentation and in those that follow later in the year that our teachers achieved these goals and have been the source of Horace Mann School success for over 125 years. Our next alumni faculty webcast will feature Dr. Harry Ball from our Upper Division English Department. The webcast is scheduled for Tuesday, November 29th at 1 p.m., and the topic will be Shakespeare, Our Contemporary. It's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Jeffrey White. Jeff. All right. Well, this is certainly quite a, a trip and a new experience for me. I'm, um, I'm sitting in the physics lab in Fort Simer, which is pretty much right where you left me, I would imagine. And um, Fort Simer may look a little bit different, and the campus might look a little different. Um, the pitcher's mound is not there at the moment. It'll be back in the spring. And I have to assure you that what is absolutely the same is the energy and the spirit and ambition that the students bring to my classes, and that's very exciting. And so that's pretty much as you left. So here's one of our students um, sitting in the AT physics lab. You may or may not recognize it, but that's how we are right now, doing a double pendulum experiment. And I'll have more to, um, to say about that a little later on in, in, in this talk. So I have to tell you about the class of 2013. That 2013 that's our current juniors. They're playing a game called Assassin. And as far as I know, it's still going on. And it's a very interesting game. What happens is each student is assigned a target. And each student is a target to someone else. Assassination comes when, when they, you tap the person with a plastic spoon. And so I thought, boy, this is a very easy game to model. I could just, it's binary, you know, you're in the game, you're out of the game. There's sort of a mean free path from class to class and meters. We have a total number of meters in the corridor. Not allowed to assassinate anybody in class, because by college men, you know. And so here they are, um, and it turns out, interestingly enough, that the game is not quite so simple. For one thing, there's that fellow over there in the orange shirt, Gregory, and he's pursuing a strategy of non-involvement, it seems, that you know nobody's paying any attention to him, and therefore he continues in the game without being killed. We're down to two finalists at the moment. 
Um, and they're pretty hilarious, um, stalking each other. They have bodyguards. I approached one the other day, and I tapped her on the shoulder. What do I know? She's still mad at me. She was got to get her off the ceiling. Um, they're very tightly wound, these kids. Um, who are still in it. But I don't know if this game will ever end. They're being very, very careful. And it's interesting that the game is a model for this, this aspect of science and inquiry generally called complexity. So I'll be referring to it throughout the talk. The issue is that although the actions are very simple, the students interact with each other. So there's a relationship that goes on that makes the game much harder to analyze. And sometimes the, the, the um, this conspiratorial, and some of it is like, well, she's tracking who, you know, she's been after him all year long, but other times it's much more intellectual, and I never imagined that students would be that way about the game, and so um, I guess that's kind of who we are, but the point is they talk to each other, they share targets, um, they make plans to avoid other people, and it makes the game much more difficult um, to think about and um, puts it in the realm of, of complexity. One of the originators of this mode of inquiry is Philip Anderson. He's a Nobel laureate in physics. And it isn't that we disregard the basic laws of physics. I still teach Newton's laws with every bit as much enthusiasm as I ever did. But the issue is that when you look at an issue, a, a problem like the game or or some other phenomena, there's another layer above the fundamental laws. And the speculation is that perhaps there are other laws as yet undetermined that we might apply to these different phenomena besides the fundamental laws that everybody um, looks at. And um, another one of the, of the founders, really, of the, of the mode of thinking is, is David Sherrington. He's a professor of physics at Oxford. And one of the founding members of the Santa Fe Institute, which is where a lot of this work goes on, and Sherrington has written about spin glass, which is one of the first problems that people looked at this way. And the issue is, is the, the idea is this. You have a, a group of molecules, that it's amorphous like a glass, and each of the molecules has a magnetic dipole, sort of like a bar magnet. And the dipoles can either align parallel or anti-parallel. They can be in the same direction or in opposite direction. And this would not be as hard a problem as it is, but for the fact that the alignment of, of two molecules can influence the alignment of other molecules nearby. So again, you get this relational behavior. You can model this behavior with a completely different problem called the Dean's problem that statisticians have looked at for a long time. And you can imagine that there are three students um, or groups of three students, and that the dean has to assign them to one of two dorms. And the issue is that the students might want to be together, or they might want to be apart. And you see in the upper left, if the three students all want to be together, then assignment is not too difficult. You don't have to disappoint anybody. But if one, one pair of the students wants to be apart, then you've got trouble. There's no way to assign these three students in two dorms without disappointing somebody. If there's one and three both want to be with two, but they don't want to be together. On the other hand, if you have two of the pairs wanting to be apart and one together, then you can do it. Um, and, and so that would be this situation. If all three students want to be apart and you have two dorms, Clearly, you can't, you can't assign them without disappointing someone. And there's a pattern. If an odd number of the pair interaction is apart, so here there's one apart and here are three apart, you have to disappoint somebody. And this is the basis of the mathematics that can be built up to look at the Dean's problem or the, the question of magnetic dipole alignment in spin glass. So, Approaches that have their origin in physics have been generalized to look at a wide variety of problems, not just in physics. And this is partly what makes the uh, work of interesting to me in thinking about my students. The central ideas are the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so that means that in addition to the fundamental behavior 
of each element in the system, there's a relationship, relational behavior, and that's what makes the, the behavior complex. There's a difference between complex and complicated, and the elements in the system can be very simple. You might have, for example, two or three ants on a table and a piece of lettuce, and they'll never find the lettuce. But if you have lots of ants, somehow in the interaction of all of these ants, they manage to find the lettuce, they carry it back where it has to go, they donate it to charity, they do all of these things that they do um, collectively, and they can't possibly do this independently. And that's the, the, the core of the complexity idea, that behavior arises from the group. And so one of the examples of, of complexity that I personally like a lot is, is, is a cellular automaton. And here you have a grid that can be one, two, or three-dimensional. Mathematically, maybe it could be n-dimensional. I don't know. The cells in the grid follow very simple rules, very well-defined rules. And then depending on the rules and how you start the game, very interesting patterns sometimes emerge. Why? That's not clearly defined yet. Nobody really has a clue about that, as far as I know. Um, but sometimes they can be stationary patterns. Therefore, can you have emergent behavior that's stationary? We'll have to see about that. Here's an example of a cellular automaton, the game of life. It's a very famous example. And you see there's a website here. If you want to go play the game of life, you can at this website. And um, I, I, I play, so I, I don't see why anybody else wouldn't want to play. And um, here are the rules. A cell that's off, which we call a dead cell, will go on a live cell if three live neighbors are around it. Now, each cell interior in the grid has eight neighbors because these are horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. If exactly three are on, it becomes a live cell. A live cell with two or three live neighbors stays that way. And so you can see in this case, the middle cell would stay alive. The end cell might die, depending on what's going on out here. Um, here, this middle cell has three live neighbors. Um, this cell has two live neighbors, so it could stay on. Here, all the cells would stay alive, because each has three live neighbors. In other cases, with fewer than two live neighbors or more than three live neighbors, the cell dies, which is to say it goes off. And so what happens is each cell has to be evaluated relative to its neighbors, and then the whole game changes at once. So you don't change cell by cell and then evaluate. You have to look at all of the cells in the grid, and then it changes. So here's what it looks like. This is the game of life. And like I say, you can go to this website and play, and here's the starting condition for the game of life. And you can see these five cells are initially alive. Now, you could play this game by hand if you really wanted to. You could say this cell here, for example, has one, two, three, four live neighbors. That's not good. So this cell would go off. Some of the other cells would go on. You'd evaluate the state of each of these cells, and then you'd go up to generation one. And you could do that, but like I say, if you run the computer program, it will run through to 1,620 generations in the time it takes to take a sip of coffee. And so that's what I do. I drink coffee and I let it run. And after 1,620 um, generations, you might get something like this. This is exactly the same grid. I did not move the scroll bars at all. And um, you can see that these, these patterns arise. And what's interesting is that they don't change. And so you can run another 100 or 1,000 or 2,000 generations, and these patterns will stay essentially the same. The bar is interesting. The center cell stays on because it has two live neighbors, but the top and bottom cells go off because they only have one live neighbor. On the other hand, this cell adjacent to the bar will go on because it has three live neighbors, and likewise this one. So the vertical bar flips between a vertical bar and a horizontal bar, and then it goes back to a vertical bar in the next generation. It just sits there going back and forth, back and forth. Why? I don't know. What does it mean? Well, I'm not too sure about that either. But um, it will be interesting to see what happens. So if you go to this game, turn on as many cells as you want, press go, you can play along. And if you find a pattern, 
Um, maybe you could let me know before you tell the rest of the world so I feel like I know something. It'd be very cool. Um, so that's the game of life. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if I could look at all my students as somehow this big cellular automaton and, and, and they would play the game? Because it's my job, after all, to manipulate them into learning as much as possible. In the business, we call it motivate, which sounds a lot better. But this is really what I'm trying to do. And so the question would be, what are the states of each student to start? What would be the rules for changing states? And how would I start everything off in the beginning? And honestly, I have no idea about this right now. So anybody out there who can think of a good way to define this, I'm very eager to know and turn all of my students into a computer game. Right. Um, but that's something I'm thinking about. Now, Jeffrey West, on the other hand, is a physicist who has a much bigger field of view. And what he's been doing lately is he's applying the ideas of physics to the study of cities. He's a senior professor at the Santa Fe Institute. And he's very interested in cities because, after all, the world's population is all migrating towards cities. And um, now most of the world's population is in cities. And by 2050, a very large number of people will be in cities. So it pays to know about them. And what um, West has done up until now is he's taken a lot of data. And in looking at the data, he's found the most remarkable pattern. It turns out that population, crime, GDP, income, um, patents, so a, a measure of creativity, they're all, they all seem to go together. As one goes up, they all go up. This is quite a remarkable finding that um, West and his colleagues have done. It's a pattern at the moment. It's a correlation. Um, that's not the same thing as, co as, as causality. Um, everybody would love to understand the mechanism by which all of these things are correlated. And as far as I know, there's no progress on that at the moment. But it gives an example of how people are applying the ideas of physics to areas far beyond physics. The double pendulum that we study in the lab is really a great example of another aspect of complexity. So here's what the double pendulum really is. It's just two lengths of string and two masses. The masses can be different. The lengths of string can be different. And you start it by pulling one or the other mass to one side. So sometimes the pendulum can oscillate like that. And sometimes the pendulum can oscillate like that. And often it goes back and forth. So it oscillates like that. And then it oscillates like this. And maybe this oscillation will slow down. And just when you think it's dying down and it gets vertical, then this bottom one starts swinging back and forth again. There are equations you can write, a couple differential equations which allow a person to solve for the mode of oscillation. Um, I have to tell myself every now and then that this is really still a high school. And so we can't actually do that piece. But nonetheless, we can play with the system. And there's a lot to be learned. And one of the things you learn when you play with this is that the behavior is crucially dependent on how you start it. And if you pull, the, say, the bottom mass a little further to the side, or not quite so far to the side, that will dramatically affect the behavior over time. And this is the characteristic of what we call a chaotic system. A chaotic system um, is extremely sensitive to starting, systems, uh, starting conditions. So the double pendulum is a great example of a chaos machine, because it exhibits chaotic behavior. And, and we get to look at that there. Again, there are mathematical patterns that one can find in chaotic systems, and you can sort of predict what will happen over time given very precisely defined starting conditions, but it's very hard to use those to characterize in all cases exactly how the system is going to behave. And that's just with two masses and two strings. If you have a very large system like, say, weather, um, you might be able to say what happens to a little cell of, of gas in, somewhere in the atmosphere, but to start by, by looking at all the little cells of gas in the atmosphere, in theory you could predict where they're going to move and how the weather's going to go, but in practice that becomes very, very difficult. And so people look for patterns and then generalize um, 
from the pattern. I want to tell you about an institution that we have for um, book day. And, and I guess I'm going to take a little time with it. So, so we read a book every day, uh, every year. The entire high school reads a book. And the, the book is picked in late spring for the following April. This year, the book that we're reading is the Sachs book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, and I have to say that of all of the books we've read, we've been doing this almost 20 years, and of all of the books we've read, this one probably has most influenced the work that I do uh, in the classroom. Sachs is, is an extraordinary physician. He's a neurologist. And um, he writes about his patients. And, and, and the way he looks at his patients has made me think about the different dimensions of my students um, much more than I think I ever have in the past. And one of the stories that Sachs tells is called The Lost Mariner. It's a, it's a wonderful story about the fellow named Jimmy who has some kind of amnesia. And the way it works is he can remember things from maybe 30 years ago when he was in the Navy, but he remembers nothing of what happened recently. He has no short-term memory. And so if you hold a mirror to his face, He's completely astonished. He doesn't understand who that person is in the mirror because he believes that he's still back in his 20s, even though he's much older than that. Fortunately for Jimmy, very fortunately, I guess, he, um, he forgets about the mirror after about 30 seconds. So he, he doesn't remember that, and he goes back to his original state. Sachs writes that Jimmy can play a great game of checkers or tic-tac-toe, but he can't play chess because he can't remember the strategy that you have in chess long enough to, to play the game effectively. And then Sachs wonders, to his great credit, I think, whether, um, whether Jimmy has a soul. And Sachs works in a, in a sectarian institution, and he recounts how he goes to these two nuns, and he asks whether um, Jimmy has a soul. They're very upset that um, the question is raised. And um, the nuns say, you know what? You should go to see Jimmy pray in church. And so Fats goes to watch Jimmy pray, and Jimmy turns out to be completely transformed in church. He prays, he takes sacraments, his spiritual side is of extraordinary depth. And this actually illustrates a very important principle in physics, that um, at a very small level, the, the behavior of something depends upon the context in which we look at it. And so an electron could be a wave sometimes or a particle. And so Jimmy, too, his behavior apparently depends upon the context in which the behavior occurs. That's really quite extraordinary. And, and it's a, when you have maybe 20 students in front, and all of them, their context, their behavior, depends upon the context in which their behavior occurs. That's really quite an amazing um, phenomenon. And um, to think about that and the question of whether or not there were rules in general that are over and above the normal way in which I relate to my students. That might help in, in, in relating the students as, to the students as a group and helping them to behave in a group um, is very, very exciting to me. So that's, um, that's a big piece of, um, of how I would apply this. I want to take a, a moment or two and, and Okay, I want to take a moment or two and, and tell you about another activity that we have. And um, I'll show you a little bit about that, that later on. We have a conference here in November. It's affiliated with TED. And, and we have all students who are talking. And so some of the students, we have students here who make robots. We have a student who's organizing a national concussion awareness network. 
we have a student coming. She um, went to school in Great Neck, and she's going to talk to us about Intel. She was the second honors winner nationally um, at Intel for a project that looked at the anxiety of students when you take away their cell phone. And we have um, Kay Nagishi who's coming. She's a member of the class of 03. And she's going to be talking about her experience after college and a stint as a healthcare consultant in San Francisco. She joined the Global Clinton Health Initiative and went to Haiti, where she, um, she worked on uh, accumulating a database of all the healthcare providers in Haiti it was a big problem after the earthquake. Nobody knew where were the healthcare providers to, to offer the kind of support that the people needed there um, for treatment. This event is on November 19th at 10 o'clock. We're going to live stream it to the world, and we'll put the web address up shortly. And so you can join, and I encourage you all to watch um, what's come. Let me know if you want to come. And, and see this, yeah. and um, it's an example of the excellence and achievement and great and giving life that our students are able to live even at this point in their, in their career. Um, so um, so this, that, this, this question of complexity um, allows me, it's given me a way to think about my students in a group, and that's been very exciting to me. It's a, it's a way of thinking. Um, Maybe there's some way to bring them together in, in a group. You might notice that, um, that I'm marking time a little bit, but I guess I can tell you what's up. We're almost there. Um, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. One of our great institutions at Horace Mann is the Chamber Choir. And so I went to Tim Hull, the conductor, and I asked him whether he had any music that would illustrate the, the notions of complexity as I described them. The question of, of pattern, of emergent behavior, of, of chaos, and it turns out that he did. So the, the chamber choir is gathering outside, and um, um, and and they're coming in. Them on the site. And so I've asked How them to perform a piece for you that will help to sum up the ideas yeah. of complexity. And there's going to be a moment or two of air while I move the speaker to them. They're forming up. This is totally exciting. And um, and they're going to sing for you. So so I'm going to I'm going to do that right now.
And so him, Miranda, wrote about the a Kandinsky panel. It was one of the four. And I have to tell you, what excites me really is, is the, the giving students the opportunity to make connections and to get a little beyond the, 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 the very fundamental elements of, of our own discipline. I, I think there are, there are so many problems in the world right now. And it's really an extraordinary time to be teaching. We need solutions in health care. We need solutions in, in, in diplomacy, heaven knows. Um, all sorts of energy, all sorts of problems. And it may be that the insights from complexity will give us the wherewithal, um, will give my students the wherewithal to solve some of these problems, because I think that's what they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives. And it's very exciting to be with them at the beginning. I have to tell you this has been an amazing experience for me, and I very much appreciate the administration. For those of you who are watching this um, at any time, um, I appreciate your attention and, and, and the chance to do this. And I'm very much hoping to hear from you. Um, here's my email address. You can send me a tweet. I'm so modern. At Science Teacher One. And um, if you have any questions, um, I can respond for a little while now. But then afterwards, um, if you want to be just be in touch and let me know how you're doing, if we know each other, that'd be fabulous. And like I say, you can send an email or Science Teacher One. And by all means, do come to homecoming um, this Saturday, and maybe I'll see you at homecoming. Thanks again, and I'm going off now. Are there any questions? Something's supposed to happen, and I don't exactly know what. Um, okay, I'm being told we're good to go. If there are no questions, I hope everybody has a fabulous day. And like I say, I wish you all well, and I hope I hear from you sometime. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you for attending this Forest Man School alumni webcast. You may now disconnect your lines.